This is St. Paul, depicted at the time of his last imprisonment. It was during this time that he wrote his second epistle to Timothy, wherein he again instructs and admonishes Timothy and warns him to shun the conversation of those who had erred from the truth. St. Paul tells Timothy of his approaching martyrdom and death. In this second epistle to Timothy, he writes in chapter 4, verses 5, 6, and 7, Be thou vigilant, labor in all things, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill thy ministry, be sober, for I am even now ready to be sacrificed, and the time of my dissolution is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Keep the Faith is pleased to present the following program. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My very dear friends in Christ, and our Holy Mother Mary, so very, very good to be back together with you again. Every Pope in this century, including our present Great Holy Father, Pope John Paul II has warned us that we are in the last days of the world. The Bible, both in the Old and New Testament, foretells in many places about a climactic and catastrophic end of the world. Indeed, every Sunday, in the Nicene Creed that we recite at Mass, we profess our faith in the end of the world, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of the dead, and the final judgment. Every time we say, He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and of His kingdom there shall be no end. This second coming of Christ in glory will be preceded by an unprecedented era of wars and revolutions, drought and famine, pestilence, plagues of the most hideous kinds, earthquakes, violence, death, and especially sin and crime, unparalleled in human history. Christ warned that sin and evil would abound in the world, and the love of most people, he warned, would grow cold. Shortly before he died, Pope Pius XII, and this was in the middle 1950s, said that there was more sin in the world at that time than at any other time in all of human history. Even before the flood, when Almighty God had to destroy practically the entire human race to put an end to sin and evil. Indeed, this is why God will end human history, end the world. This is why there will be a second coming of Christ and a final judgment simply to put an end to all the evil in the world. So few will be saved. So many will be lost for all eternity that Almighty God in His infinite mercy and justice will have to put an end to the world and its sin and evil. The Bible warns us that it will be during these last days that Lucifer will make one last desperate effort 
to crush out once and for all the kingdom of God on earth and to reestablish his own kingdom of hell on this entire planet. Satan has never forgiven our divine Savior for establishing the kingdom of God on earth. This is the New Testament name for the Roman Catholic Church. We are the kingdom of God because we accept the kingship of Christ. We submit to his law and to his rule over us. Well, prior to the coming of Jesus Christ, the whole world was under the control of Satan. This is clearly taught in the Old Testament. And that is why in the ancient world there was so much war. There was so much slavery and sin and rape and pillage. Even our Lord referred to Satan as the ruler, the prince of this world. And his apostle, St. Paul, went so far as to call Lucifer the god of this world because he is the one who is worshipped by the greater part of this planet. So he has never, Satan has never forgiven our Lord for interrupting his control of the entire world. And for the past 2,000 years, he and all his minions in hell have done everything they possibly can by persecution, by internal revolution, by heresy, by schism, everything they, that they can to crush out this reign of God on earth established by Jesus Christ. And that is why our Lord warned, He who is not with me is against me. We are in the midst of a cosmic struggle between good and evil. There is no neutral ground. Oh, your atheists say, well, we want to get rid of God. Uh, we just want to do our own thing. We just want to build our own heaven on earth. We want to be neutral. There is no neutrality. If we are not for Christ, we are against him. If we are not fighting in the kingdom of Christ, then we have been duped into the kingdom of Satan. Well, during these last days of the world, the Bible tells us that Satan will raise up a great antichrist who will reign over a world empire. He will enslave the entire world under his power and then will unleash a horrendous persecution of the Catholic Church and a reign of terror, the like of which history has neither known nor imagined. In addition to taking over the world, he will take over all religions. He will subdue all churches, and he will combine and amalgamate them into one great world religion and eventually make every human being bow down and worship him as God under penalty of death by starvation. This Antichrist of Lucifer will not be the Lord Maitreya of the New Age movement and Benjamin Krem. No, it will be someone else who will come not out of the Middle East, but out of Europe. I think this Lord Maitreya is merely a tactical feint to distract us from the real Antichrist, who perhaps at this very moment is preparing to make his appearance on the world scene. This Antichrist is foretold specifically by St. John the Apostle in his first two epistles. And John warns us that the Antichrist will be preceded and prefigured by many, many Antichrists, just as our Lord was prefigured by many great men in the Old Testament. The patriarch Joseph, the prophet Moses, the great King David, 
all prefigured one or another of the great qualities that would be combined in Jesus Christ. Well, Satan loves to ape God. So his great antichrist will be preceded by many, many antichrists who will give us a foretaste of what he will be like. Henry VIII would be an example of a mini antichrist because he stole all of England away from the mystical body of Christ. He took the church in England and made it into the church of England. Napoleon Bonaparte will be another example of a mini Christ. And in our own century, Vladimir Lenin embodied uh, very well all the evil and malice that will be found in the Antichrist. And last but not least, Adolf Hitler. Of all of them, the most perfect example of what the Antichrist will be when he comes. In chapter 13 of his Apocalypse, St. John describes the reign of this great Antichrist and the ways in which he will come to power and gain control over the world. He is called the Antichrist because he will do everything within his power to dethrone our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to take Christ's place as the God-man and as the only true savior of the world. This is why there is such a tremendous effort today to downgrade Jesus Christ. Uh, this motion picture, the so-called The Last Temptation of Christ, is part of the effort of the Antichrist and his minions to dethrone Jesus Christ. The reason Satan wants to dethrone our Lord is so that he can ascend and take his place. In 1903, the great pontiff pope, St. Pius X, the one who condemned modernism, was of a mind that the Antichrist might already be alive on earth in his day. Pope Pius XII, in his Easter message of 1957, said that the signs predicted in the Bible that would usher in the Antichrist were already fulfilled, and that the last judgment was near at hand. In 1943, Pius XII wrote his great encyclical, on the mystical body of Christ, which is another biblical name for the Catholic Church, the Kingdom of God. And this is how this great pontiff described the reign of the Antichrist over the world. In this he said, the most decisive hour of human history, the king of evil, an infernal cunning. Notice the vicar of Christ recognizes Satan as the king of evil and infernal cunning. Uses every means and all forms to destroy faith and morality. This was spoken 45 years ago. Long before abortion, the butchering of a million and a half babies every year in the United States, 55 million abortions throughout the world. This was before drugs became a pandemic in the United States, before pornography, before child abuse, before homosexuality and all those other perversions that are spreading like a melanoma cancer throughout the world. Satan, the pontiff, warned us, uses every means and all forms to destroy faith and morality. And finally he concluded, 
God and the evil one have come to grips in a gigantic duel. The battle, the most bitter, the most ferocious the world has ever known, has been joined. And you and I, and our fellow Catholics throughout the world, are now locked in this battle that is the most bitter and the most ferocious the world has ever seen. Just about a hundred years ago, the then reigning pontiff Leo XIII was finishing Mass in the morning, and he had a vision, and he saw Satan standing before Christ enthroned in the tabernacle. And Satan was boasting, he said, within a hundred years, I will destroy your church. Leo XIII was so shaken by this vision that he fell to his knees. He had to be assisted to the sacristy by his assistants. As soon as he was composed, this is when he sat down and composed that beautiful prayer to St. Michael that we used to say, after every low mass, to defend the church and to defend us in this hour of battle. What a good thing it would be if each of us would start saying that prayer once again every day. Yet, the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament, chapter 12, verse 10, he warned that when the great Antichrist finally did appear on the world scene, the vast majority of mankind would be taught to totally unaware that his reign was beginning. Indeed, St. Paul tells us in his first letter to the Thessalonians that the beginning of the reign of the Antichrist will actually be hailed by most people as the dawn of a new era of peace and security. The main question that I want to address this afternoon is how can we recognize the Antichrist? Should he come in the lifetime of most of us here? How can we recognize him? What are the marks foretold in the Bible? by which we will know he is, in fact, the Antichrist. And what will his reign over the world be like? Both the Old and the New Testament contain many descriptions of the Antichrist and his reign, as well as sacred tradition, which has preserved for us the preaching of the apostles, as recorded by the early martyrs and saints of the church. Describing the Antichrist this afternoon, delineating his marks, I will be drawing from what is written in Holy Scripture and what can be found in the sacred tradition of the church. The best overall description of the Antichrist is given by St. Paul in his second letter to the Christians of Thessalonica in chapter 2. And this is what Paul said. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our assembling to meet him, that day will not come until the apostasy comes first. Apostasy is a Greek word meaning a rebellion against Christ a rejection of Christ, what we might call today the death of God. Complete rejection of God, rejection of his rights over us, over our government, over our social life. And we are seeing this apostasy not only here in our beloved America, we're seeing it as an organized formal revolt of Marxism against Almighty God and his rights over the world. And the reason these people want to kill God, the reason these people are proclaiming the death of God, is so that they can take God's place. 
So Paul continues, that day will not come until the apostasy comes first and the man of sin is revealed. The son of hell, Paul calls him, who will exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember, Paul wrote, that when I was still with you, I told you this, and you know what is restraining him now. Paul didn't mention it in his letter, but we know what that obstacle is from sacred tradition about which Paul was speaking that would restrain the reign of the Antichrist. So Paul says, and you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his own time. For the hidden power of sin is already at work, but he who now restrains it can do so only until he is removed, and then the lawless one will be revealed. The coming of this lawless one will be by the working of Satan, with all power and pretended signs and wonders. That is why we must be so careful today, especially about reputed apparitions that have not been approved by the magisterium. Our Lord warned us in Matthew's Gospel that the devil will work such great signs and wonders so as to deceive even the elect and lead them astray. With all power and pretended signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception of those who are to perish, because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Therefore, God will send upon them a strong delusion to make them believe what is false so that they may be condemned, who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in sinful living. The reign of the Antichrist is a punishment from God upon a sinful and rebellious mankind. Because man did not worship his Creator, because mankind is not grateful to Almighty God for all his benefactions, because mankind is refusing to serve God, his punishment will be that he must now serve the devil. And the devil's vicar on earth, the Antichrist himself. The restraining obstacle which previously held back the reign of the Antichrist, according to sacred tradition, was the Gentile occupation of Israel and the holy city of Jerusalem. The Antichrist will become the supreme ruler of Israel, the state of Israel. This is what that acronym, or that number 666 means. It stands for the king, the ruler of Israel. Well, so long as Palestine and the city of Jerusalem were in Gentile control, it would be impossible for the Antichrist to be hailed as the king of Israel. Indeed, it is the unanimous teaching of sacred tradition, the fathers of the church, that the Antichrist will be accepted as the long-awaited Messiah by the Jewish people. As our Lord warned them in the fifth chapter of John's Gospel, I came in my Father's name, and you did not receive me, but another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. Yes, because they rejected 
the true Messiah. They must now accept the false Messiah, the Antichrist, as their savior. That is why it was impossible for the Antichrist to appear before 1967, when the Jews recaptured the holy city of Jerusalem. Indeed, it began in 1946 when they recovered part of the Holy Land and set up the new state of Israel in 1946. And that's why a year later, in his Easter message, Pope Pius XII said that the reign of the Antichrist would begin at any moment. The Antichrist will suddenly make his appearance on the world scene, emerging out of seeming obscurity. Once again, Satan, who is the ape of God, will have his Antichrist be the ape of the true Christ. Just as our Lord had a hidden life in Nazareth for 30 years before he began his public ministry, so the Antichrist will be hidden and seemingly obscure the early part of his life, and then, like the true Christ, he will suddenly appear on the world scene. The Antichrist will be a man of unsurpassed ability. He'll emerge as a great world leader, not by the sword, not by military means, but by diplomacy, by the eloquence of his speech. He'll be a man of brilliant intelligence, having a solution to every human problem. He'll have a mesmerizing eloquence that will stir vast crowds of people, bring them to their feet cheering begging him to become the ruler of the world. An excellent example was the mini-Christ Adolf Hitler. Few realize that Adolf Hitler came to power through the ballot box. His Nazi party received the majority vote in a parliamentary election. And therefore, Hitler, as the head of the party, was appointed the chancellor of Germany by President Hindenburg. Then Hitler proceeded to take over Austria. He took over Czechoslovakia. He united Romania and Italy in his Axis powers. Why will the Antichrist be such a brilliant individual? Because the Bible and the Fathers tell us he will be totally and perfectly possessed by Lucifer himself. The Antichrist will actually be the person of Lucifer. It will be a kind of, re of incarnation on his part. It won't be a true incarnation. This requires a divine power. Only God can become truly incarnate. But Lucifer will so possess the body and soul and faculties of this human being that the human person will be totally suppressed in a state of complete unconsciousness and it will be Lucifer walking on this earth. The lips that move will be human but the voice speaking will be that of Lucifer himself and he will come upon this earth finally to reign over men demanding that all bow down and worship him as God. Again, we have an example of this in Adolf Hitler, who as a young man in Vienna made a pact with the devil to become the master of the world. Adolf Hitler was possessed. This is a matter of historical record. This is why an individual of such mediocre talents, he was a paper hanger. He made his living by drawing postcards and selling them to tourists in Vienna. And yet he became the master of practically all of Europe. A man of mesmerizing eloquence. 
He hypnotized vast throngs of party members who after every speech would jump to their feet shouting and yelling, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler. Well, that was the demon who had possessed Hitler and who was ruling Germany. Adolf Hitler made the officers in his SS take an oath to Lucifer. You know, when our soldiers first liberated Europe and they opened up the gates of these extermination camps, they couldn't believe it. They simply could not believe how human beings could be so cruel, could commit such atrocities. Well, they weren't human beings. They were devils in total possession of Hitler and his SS who were capable of such viciousness and brutality. Well, when the Antichrist comes, he too will be possessed by Satan, and so will most of his minions. Nazism was a preview of coming attractions of what the reign of the Antichrist will be like. Possession is not at all like that movie, The Antichrist. That was hyped up and glamorized by Hollywood. They wanted to make a horror picture. And I'm personally convinced that Lucifer is already the chairman of the board in Hollywood. He's the one who's calling the shots there today. And so perhaps he wanted this hyped up, sensationalized movie to deceive people about what possession is really like. It's not like that at all. Who also was possessed. And this priest, in following the spirituality of the divine milieu, the phenomenon of man, this poor priest got himself possessed under the control of a demon and was totally unaware of it. And the irony of the situation was that the priest who was appointed by the bishop to exorcise him was also possessed. And he didn't know it either. And he had been his professor in the seminary, the exorcist, and who had introduced this young priest into Teilhard de Chardin. And through following his spirituality and his ideas, even the exorcist discovered that he had fallen under the mind control of Satan. There are various degrees of possession. It doesn't take place all at once. It begins with a Ouija board or tarot cards or fortune tellers or begins with astrology. And that's when we first open the door to Satan in our lives. He avoids this bizarre behavior that, that we saw in the movie Exorcist because he doesn't want people to know he's there. He doesn't want even his victim to discover that he is gradually taking over his or her life. He knows the first thing they'll do is go call an exorcist, and that's the last person in the world he wants to see. And there are various degrees of, of possession, so finally you reach that perfect degree we saw in the instance of Adolf Hitler. For a demon is able to imitate perfectly the personality of his human victim, whose own consciousness he has completely suppressed. And according to Marilyn Ferguson, in her book on the New Age Movement, The Aquarian Conspiracy, and of course, according to your own Mrs. Constance Cumby here in Detroit. There are far more people possessed today than we realize. All these new methods of meditation, Eastern spirituality, are really short courses in how to get yourself possessed. Transcendental meditation, 
ESG, Earhart Seminar Training, Silva Mind Control, Biofeedback, Yoga, Stress Management Programs, Techniques, New Age Spirituality, the Mind Sciences, Anchor Hold, which is being introduced as a form of spirituality among Catholics, A Course in Miracles, all of these are methods to get oneself under the control of a demon. Silver mind control, I can speak from experience. I started to take his program. I was talked into it by another priest. They don't tell you in the beginning that eventually they're going to have you communicating with higher intelligences from out of space. This is all part of the occult. You're not told in the beginning what you're getting into. Until finally you reach a point, I'm afraid, where it's too late. Well, one weekend of that, I got as far away from those people as I could get. Father Matthew Fox, a Dominican, has established out in California his Center for Creation, Centered Spirituality. This is simply another technique to get oneself possessed. This is why he brings in people like Starhawk, a registered witch, to teach in his program. It's basically a reversion to paganism, to nature worship, to the worship of creation. And that is the very trap into which Teilhard de Chardin himself fell. According to a recent Gallup poll, at least 10 million Americans have dabbled in this Eastern mysticism and are in some degree of diabolical possession. Well, these are the shock troops, the advanced troops of the Antichrist, who will be marshaled under his flag when he unleashes his reign of terror on the earth. The Bible tells us that the Antichrist will have complete control of all the real wealth of the world. Daniel chapter 11 says he shall control the riches of gold and silver. I'm sure there's some here this afternoon who can remember when we had gold and silver coins. And that's real money because it has a real intrinsic value. I remember when I was a youngster, even the dollar bill, I'd sometimes receive one for a birthday, and as you can imagine, as a youngster, I would examine it very carefully. I would always notice it used to say, redeemable in silver from the United States Treasury. But if you've examined a dollar bill lately, you will notice it no longer says that. Instead, it calls it a Federal Reserve note. All real money was taken from us, at least the gold, in 1932 by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And our silver was taken from us by Nixon in 1971. And in its place was issued this paper money, which has no intrinsic value. As it itself said, it's a Federal Reserve note. And a note is legal jargon for an IOU. It's really just a piece of paper. No, all real wealth has been taken from the American people and concentrated in the hands of the minions of the Antichrist. They say even our goal at Fort Knox is no longer there. It's all been assembled in deep vaults in Geneva, Switzerland. So just what is this piece of paper worth? It's not worth silver anymore. It's not worth gold. Well, it's worth whatever the Federal Reserve says it's worth. By printing more of them, as they did during the presidency of Jimmy Carter, they decreased its value. The more dollars there were, the the less each was worth. 
or they can print less of them. They can constrict the money supply. They can call these in on loans, and then they can cause a depression. Mr. Alan Greenspan, who presently is the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, he wrote an article in 1958, and he said that the Federal Reserve manipulation of currency, or the money supply in the 1920s, is what brought on the stock market crash of 1929. And Mr. Greenspan says, quote, caused the American economy to, to collapse. All the Fed, as it's called, has to do is call in its loans and limit the money supply. Well, this is when brokers then have to call in loans that they've made to their clients. And this is when the clients have to go out and sell their cars and watches and rings or whatever they can to pay off the brokers. And this causes a chain reaction in a nation. And this is what brought about the great crash of 1929 and the depression of the 1930s. Our lives, our fortunes, and our honor today are at the mercy of the Federal Reserve Board. And I'm sure most of you think that it's just another government agency. A Federal Reserve System is no more a part of our federal government than is Federal Express, the overnight package delivery people, or the Federal Dry Cleaners. The Federal Reserve System is a private corporation owned by private individuals. It is a secret corporation. It is so secret, it is the only corporation in America that does not have to publish the names of its principal stockholders. Every other business corporation in our country has to have on file a list of its principal stockholders that are open to public inspection. The only private corporation that doesn't have to do this is the Federal Reserve System. So we don't even know who owns it. It's the most secret, mysterious corporation in America. And it's probably owned by the international bankers, by the Rothschilds and the Warburgs and the other international bankers, to whom we American taxpayers owe the national debt. You know, sometimes the press will tell us, well, don't worry about the national debt. We owe it to ourselves. Well, if we owe that national debt to ourselves, why do we have to pay $100 billion a year in interest on it? No, that national debt is owned by international bankers. And this is how the Antichrist will gain control of the world. As Meyer Anschel, the founder of the Rothschild banking dynasty said, I don't care who make your, makes your laws. Just let me print your money. Because he who prints the money controls the economy, controls the nation, and even controls the Congress that makes the laws. The Federal Reserve System is so secret, you cannot even audit it. Now, every corporation in America is open to audit by the federal government. In 1978, a congressman introduced a law in Congress to audit the Federal Reserve. It's never been audited. But he wanted to find out what they're doing with all our money and why they've imposed this tremendous debt on the American people. By the time that law got through Congress, and was passed, it said just the opposite. The Federal Reserve may not be audited. That tells you the control the Federal Reserve has over our Congress. That it can take a law introduced by a congressman and make it come through exactly opposite to what was intended. Though the Federal Reserve system is part of that great deception of which St. Paul spoke in his letter to the Thessalonians, 
In other words, it's a central bank that controls all the other banks in our country. And did you know that a central bank is the third plank of the Communist Manifesto, written by Karl Marx in 1848, nearly 150 years ago? If you have never read the Communist Manifesto, I would urge you to go to a large public library and get a copy. You're in for the shock of your life. The first plank of the Communist Manifesto is a federal income tax. Karl Marx was the first one to propose a federal income tax on all wagers, wage earners in a country. The second plank is to substitute paper money for real money of gold and silver. Everything that Karl Marx laid down for the economic enslavement of a nation is already in place right here in America. Including women's liberation. The destruction of marriage and family life for the sake, for the sake of so-called woman's liberation. Even this is spelled out by Karl Marx. So where is the reign of the Antichrist in the world today? Well, it's in Russia, where you have the economic enslavement of an entire people. It's in China, where these people are nothing but slave laborers for the Communist Party. The reign of the Antichrist is in Cambodia, where three million Cambodians were slaughtered by their own government. It's in Vietnam, it's in Laos, it's in Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and right here in the United States. We are under the Communist Manifesto already. And this is what Daniel warned us about. He said most people would be totally unaware that they were being taken over by the Antichrist. When? did our beloved America fall under the control of the Antichrist. We know the exact date, January the 23rd, 1973, when our Supreme Court enacted the death penalty against 20 million helpless babies in our country by abortion. This was a sign that we had fallen under the control of the Antichrist. Whenever the devil gets control of a nation, and I don't care where it is, he demands human sacrifice. That is the price that those who give themselves to the devil must pay. Now normally in the past, this human sacrifice was paid by war, by revolution, by murder, by crime. Well, the most scientific form of human sacrifice today is abortion, where a mother's womb becomes the altar on which a human life is sacrificed to Lucifer. According to Solzhenitsyn, the communists have already killed 66 million of their own people in Russia, either through war, execution, or slave labor camps. That is the price that the communists paid to Lucifer and to his antichrist. So where is the reign of the antichrist today? Well, practically two-thirds of our planet has already been subjected to his power and authority. And as far as the rest of the world goes, it is just a matter of time. The World Bank will see to it that every other nation is brought to its knees through inflation, through a huge national debt. Everybody will be enslaved to this World Bank whose chief executive is the Antichrist. The Bible and tradition also warn us 
that the agents of the Antichrist will infiltrate the Catholic Church and will take over its visible structure. I'm afraid this is what we are seeing today, not only in America, but throughout the world. The Antichrist will take over our schools and use them to teach modernism, which is the religion of the Antichrist. He will take over our colleges, our once great Catholic colleges. He will infiltrate and take over our chancery office, our parish offices, our United States Catholic Conference, and the like. This is described by St. John in the Apocalypse, chapter 12. The woman clothed with the sun and the red dragon, who drives the church underground, who persecutes the church. And then in the following chapter 13, John warns us of this false prophet who will arise. And all the fathers of the church tell us the false prophet will be a Catholic bishop, an apostate bishop who will join the Antichrist and help him in his rule over Catholics. This has happened many times before in history. The Jewish church was taken over by Satan. In the time of Christ, he had complete control of the Sanhedrin, the scribes and Pharisees. And he used those very leaders of the chosen people who should have led them to Christ. He used those leaders to execute their Messiah. A prime example of this would be in England under Henry VIII and Archbishop Cramner, where they literally stole the Catholic Church away from the See of Peter. If you've ever gone to England, I'm sure you've gone to Westminster Cathedral, to York Cathedral, to those other magnificent churches there. They were once all as Catholic as this church here, and they were all stolen by Henry VIII and Archbishop Cramner when they broke away. And 95% of Catholics went right along with that many antichrists. All of the clergy, all of the priests threw in with that many antichrists. And every bishop in England, except one, John Fisher, who was beheaded, threw in and joined that Antichrist, and stealing the church from the vicar of Christ. Well, how will his minions take over the church? By infiltration. This is their battle cry. If you can't feed them, join them. We have been infiltrated by Masons for, well, ever since their foundation, over 200 years ago. This is why our once beautiful liturgy has been so watered down. Archbishop Bonini was a Mason, and I had this on the very best authority, who had infiltrated the Congregation for Divine Worship and did everything in his power to obscure the Mass as a sacrifice and to turn it into simply a Protestant communion service. Now, our Mass and our new liturgy is valid. If said by a validly ordained priest with the right intention, the Mass is still valid. But Bunini did everything he could to obscure the Mass as a sacrifice and to present it simply as a meal, a Protestant communion service. And just a few months ago, I was attending a workshop with Bishop Jerome Hasrich of, of Texas. And he got up and said, and I quote, and he gave me permission to quote him, he said, the ICEL, the International Commission on English in the Liturgy, is trying to Protestantize our Catholic Mass, unquote. You know, they've got a new sacramentary, a new missile in the works. And I'm sure that when that does appear, 
They promise it before the end of the century. They will do away completely with the Mass as a sacrifice. Oh, they'll keep a lot of the vestments and other external accoutrements. They'll try to pretend it's still the good old Catholic Mass. But it will be nothing more than a Protestant communion service. And Daniel, the great prophet Daniel in the Old Testament warned, the Antichrist will do away with the everlasting sacrifice. This will be the mark of the beast by which we will recognize him. He will do away with the Mass as a sacrifice of Christ on Calvary and substitute in its place a Protestant communion service. In 1953, Manning Johnson, an ex-communist, testified before the House Judiciary Committee that the Communist Workers' Party in America had received orders from Moscow in 1936 to infiltrate the churches. Well, he came out of the party, but when he testified in 1953, he said that in infiltrating the churches, and especially seminaries, they were successful beyond their most optimistic ambitions. We have been infiltrated by the communists here in America. This is why the USCC is so leftist. This is why the campaign for human development gives millions of dollars to every radical and active group that comes down the pike and yet has not given one penny to pro-life groups. <clears throat> This is why liberation theology, which is nothing more than Marxism in Christian terminology, has replaced the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Catholic Church has always, also been thoroughly infiltrated by homosexuals. Just recently, Father Enrique Brueda came out with this text documenting the infiltration of every facet of our society by this so-called gay liberation movement. And he has devoted two entire chapters to the infiltration of churches in general and the Catholic Church in particular. And this information he drew from the publications of the so-called gay liberation movement itself. He went right to their offices and to their headquarters. Apparently he thought they were, he was going to join them. And they gave him all this information by which he has documented how our church in America has been thoroughly infiltrated by homosexuals. This is why there are so many lawsuits against priests for child abuse, sexual abuse of boys. Last summer it was 50. This summer, it rose to 134 civil suits against priests for these sexually abusing children. And Father Ruida says not only priests, but perhaps even bishops have been drawn into this homosexual ring. Their whole purpose, they know they're not going to get the Pope to come out and approve of sodomy. But they think that by infiltrating the clergy, they can neutralize the church's teaching, just as the modernists did with the pill. You ask most Catholics today, what's the church's teaching on contraception? Well, they're really not sure. It's been so compromised by the modernists. Well, this is what the homos want here in America. They want to be accepted. They want their lifestyle accepted as a normal, ordinary, everyday, alternate lifestyle. They know the only way they can achieve that goal is by infiltrating the Catholic Church, which is the greatest obstacle to their acceptance. Father Rueda points out how the homosexuals have infiltrated religious orders. The Jesuits, they've infiltrated the Franciscans, the Christian Brothers, and, of course, the Dominicans. 
When I was in the seminary in the early 1950s, my superior in the seminary said at that time we were being inundated by homosexuals. And he was doing his best to weed them out. He wrote a letter pleading with our major superior to help him. The letter was never answered. So he wrote a letter to our provincial council pleading with them for help to weed out these homosexuals. They never answered his letter. I'm afraid that we had been so taken over by communists at this time, they rejoiced to have us infiltrated by homosexuals. They are so strong in my province, they have succeeded in electing one of their own as our major superior. Donald J. Gergen is mentioned three times in this book by Father Rueda as one of the national leaders of the homosexual movement and infiltration in America today. Two years ago, he was elected the major superior of the Central Dominican province. That shows you how strong the homosexuals are in the Dominican order. It's so bad today that a good boy can't even get in my province. I've talked to some of the finest young men I have ever met who were turned away from our novitiate. They wouldn't let them in. No, to become a Dominican in the central part of America today, you've got to be effeminate. Or at least you've got to approve of homosexuality as an alternate lifestyle. And of course, as Mrs. Constance Cumbie has so well documented, we've been invaded by New Agers and by modernists. And modernism, as she has explained so well, is the religion of the Antichrist. Well, who are these agents of the Antichrist in the Catholic Church today? Their name is Legion. Father Teilhard de Chardin. Father Karl Rahner. One of the Paredeses at Vatican II. Indeed, he's the man who destroyed those five great schemas that John XXIII had prepared. Before the council even convened, Pope John XXIII had five beautiful schemas. The one on our Blessed Mother was going to proclaim her mediatrix of all graces. These were all sabotaged by Fa Father Karl Rahner. Father Hans Klung, another Paritas. Gregory Baum, who still teaches at a Catholic college, St. Michael's in Toronto. Father Charles Curran of Catholic University. Richard P. McBrien, Richard McCormick of the University of Notre Dame. I went to Notre Dame as a young man. It was there I received my vocation of the priesthood. But I would not send my son there, or my nephew or my niece. Raymond Brown, the so-called scripture scholar. Father Eugene Levidre, another scripture scholar of the Catholic Theological Union. Father Matthew Fox, who's teaching this creation-centered spirituality, was, which is simply a, a do-it-yourself course in getting possessed. And, of course, Donald J. Gergen, a major superior of the Dominican Order here in the central United States. He's working on a five-volume work that he calls Christology. It is nothing but rank modernism. I went to a lecture of his just to see for myself what he's teaching. When he raised the question, is Jesus Christ God? He responded, yes, because we're all gods. Remember Shirley MacLaine, out on a limb, I am God? Yes, this is the war cry of the New Age movement. We're all God. So a New Ager is the major superior of the Dominicans in the central United States. Again, this illustrates how powerfully they have infiltrated the church. Well, now the final question is when. 
As the disciples asked our Lord in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, When, Lord, will all these things come to pass? Happily, we have a timetable from the devil himself. In the middle 1880s, he vowed that within a hundred years he would destroy the Catholic Church. Well, from where I stand, he has just about succeeded. We also have Michael Nostradamus, who was kind of a satanic Daniel. Nostradamus was possessed too. He had all these symptoms of clairvoyance, uh, he could cure people. Well, he wrote a kind of book of Daniel. Again, the devil tries to ape God, outlining Satan's game plan for his antichrist and the takeover of the world. The quatrain of Nostradamus predicted the rise of Napoleon and Adolf Hitler as two many antichrists. Nostradamus himself died in 1566, so, so far, Satan's game plan is on target. In 1986, the devil had scheduled the world for a great famine that would begin in this year. And you remember Our Lady, her first warning at Fatima. She says, God is about to punish the world by war, famine, and persecution of the church. Well, I think the devil's a little ahead of schedule now. This greenhouse effect, meteorologists tell us, started in 1980. And this is why we had such a great drought in America and throughout the world this year. In 1988, the devil has the world scheduled for many violent earthquakes. And if you've been following the daily press, you'll notice the many, many earthquakes throughout the world. I was in California for just two weeks this summer, and I experienced two of them while I was there. In 1994, the devil has scheduled World War III, or sooner if he can get it. And this is also prophesied by Ezekiel in the Old Testament, chapter 38 and 39. And it's going to begin with a Russian invasion of the state of Israel. And it's at this time that the Antichrist is scheduled to make his appearance, to come out of obscurity and hiding, and to manifest himself in the world. We know that if Russia invades Israel, America will be drawn into that war. According to Senator Fulbright, and this was 15 years ago, the Zionists control 70 votes in the United States Senate. So if Israel is attacked, we will be drawn into that war and a nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. And this is exactly what the devil wants. Because he's going to build his empire of terror on the ruins of the world in which we now live. You recall it was during the crisis of the Great Depression that Franklin Delano Roosevelt came to power in America and really turned our country around, made us a collective estate by his New Deal policies. And yet he was elected not only to a third term, but he would have been elected to a fourth term and a fifth term. He rose to power amid the ashes of the Depression. And this is what Satan will use to usher in his Antichrist as the great savior of the world. And by 1999, Lucifer is planning a merger of the United States of America and the Soviet Union, or what's left of us after this nuclear exchange into a one world government. That America will give up its Bill of Rights, the American people will give up their constitution and their national sovereignty and join a communist world government. 
If you're hearing about this for the first time, I know your reaction. It was mine. Impossible. Things like this just don't happen. The American people surrendering their rights and their freedoms, their national sovereignty to a communist world government, it can never happen. Well, a good priest friend of mine 20 years ago gave me a book entitled None Dare Call It Treason. It was written during the 1960s, oh, the 1950s actually, the presidency of Eisenhower. And he documented how our federal government, or at least people in the government, were doing everything they could to build up the Soviet Union into a superpower. Prior to that, Russia was a third-rate nation, technologically, industrially. And yet people in our country were working to build up the Soviet Union and to weaken the United States. What really convinced me was the autobiography of General Douglas MacArthur. Remember when he was removed as Supreme Commander in Korea? He was ordered, and this is in his own words, his own biography, he was ordered to withdraw entirely from Korea. You remember he had conquered all of Korea, south and north. He was right up to the Yalu River. And President Harry Truman told him to withdraw, to surrender the entire peninsula to the communists. General Douglas MacArthur refused to abandon the graves of his dead soldiers who had given their lives. And that's why he was fired and removed. Our government did not want us to win in Korea. This is why we lost the war in Vietnam. Our army could have won that war in six weeks if our government let them. But they put so many restrictions on our fighting forces, they actually made it impossible for them to win in Vietnam. They wanted that war to drag out so that the American people would get so disgusted with it, they would want no more war and would be willing to surrender to this world government. This is why... Senator Joe McCarthy was so smeared by the press. Joe McCarthy was a, a courageous Catholic man, but he was getting too close to exposing these men in our government, these traitors who are trying to sell us out to a communist world government. And who are they? Harry Hopkins, assistant to FDR. Harry Hopkins not only gave the Kremlin the plans for the atom bomb, in Lend-Lease, he shipped over all the materials to make it and the materials to build the factory in which they would make it. Harry Dexter White, Alger Hiss, Dean Rust, former Secretary of State, Robert S. McNamara, the Secretary of Defense in Vietnam, David Rockefeller of the Chase Manhattan Bank, Dr. Armand Hammer, of Occidental Petroleum has become a billionaire selling our technology to the communists, building them up as a superpower in the world. Our present Secretary of Commerce, C. William Verity, he held a meeting of 400 American industrialists that is so secret that not even our press can find out who those 400 American businessmen are. And the whole purpose of that meeting was to transfer wholesale our technology to the communists. We not only give them our technology, we give them the money to buy it. The World Bank is financed by you taxpayers. And they loan the money, our money, to the communists to buy our technology. And what makes these men so dangerous is that they actually think they are doing us a favor. This is how they propose to bring about nuclear disarmament and make the world safe. They'll tell us that only by joining a world government can we have true peace throughout the world. 
My dear friends in Christ, if this is the first time that you've heard about this plan on the part of prominent Americans to hand us over to the Communists, I know you find it very difficult to believe, as I did, but I urge you to find out about it. The reason it has succeeded is because it is so secret. Because they've withheld from the American people their real objectives in aiding the Soviet Union. And an excellent organization from which to get this information is the Cardinal Menzenti Foundation, named after that great cardinal who suffered so much in Hungary under the communists. They are trying to expose this conspiracy, and a conspiracy it is, to surrender our sovereignty and our freedoms to a world government. But what is God's counterattack? Is he going to take this line down? Well, again, the book of Revelation, chapter 15, speaks of the seven last plagues. There were previous plagues that God had sent to bring a rebellious mankind to repentance. But in chapter 15, John speaks of the seven last plagues of God's wrath against the wicked, designed to beat back the Antichrist hopefully by bringing a sinful world to repentance. The first of these plagues, the first of the seven last, says that men will break out with skin rashes all over their body. Well, that's AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. One of the effects of AIDS is they break out in these festering sores all over their body. A classmate of mine is a chaplain at a hospital. They have a ward for AIDS sufferers. He says it's the most horrible death he has ever witnessed in a hospital. AIDS is a punishment from Almighty God against these people who would so pervert his wonderful gift of sex. Now, all of God's punishments in this world are medicinal. They're designed to bring people to repentance. But as St. John warns, and this in the fourth plague, they will not repent. He says, instead, those with these sores on their bodies will shake their fists and curse God and blaspheme him. And unfortunately, that's what the gay community is doing today. They refuse to repent. They give up their perverted lifestyle, and instead they demand that we spend billions to find a cure so they can pursue their deviant pleasures. Well, there will be, be no cure. Even science says there will be no cure. This is the wrath of God, not only upon them, but upon our entire country. The sixth final plague, of course, is World War III, Armageddon, and the seventh plague thank God, is the final judgment. And by the time we've gone through this reign of terror, the Antichrist will be so happy to see Jesus Christ. We'll welcome him when he comes with open arms because he'll be the only one in his second coming who can save us from the Antichrist. Well, my dear brothers and sisters, as I'm sure you've already known, we're in for a real fight. We're in for the fight of our lives. The most bitter, the most ferocious the world has ever known. And I'm sure if you're out there fighting for life, fighting for our schools, fighting for our liturgy, you've already experienced how ferocious that fight can be. This is why it's so important we be in the state of sanctifying grace. We be right with God and be on his side, because if we're in mortal sin, we are on the side of Satan. This is why the Antichrist wants to take the Mass away from us. This is why he wants to deprive us of the real presence, because he knows our greatest strength is in Holy Communion. And we've got to get to Communion every day if we're going to have the strength to be the champions of Christ in the battle with the Antichrist. We've got to take up the sword of truth, 
Satan conquers by lies and deception. The great deception, as St. Paul says. Only truth will destroy the empire of the Antichrist. We cannot stop it. It is inevitable, but we can delay it for the sake of our children and our grandchildren. We can push back the date of his inevitable rule, and we will do it with the sword of truth by exposing what is going on in our country and what is going on in our church and standing up with John Paul, standing up for light, standing up for the liturgy, standing up for our schools and for our Catholic faith. And our Blessed Mother promised at Fatima, she says, those who consecrate themselves to my Immaculate Heart will be saved. That is why tonight as we close with benediction, I hope by now each of you has this little blue card. And we're going to reconsecrate ourselves and our children, our country, and all we love to our dear Blessed Mother. And she has promised that she will not only preserve us from the Antichrist, she will make us great soldiers in the army of Christ that will hold back his enslavement of the world.